Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, what I would ask to do is to spend about 15 minutes or so to talk a little bit about uh, the issues and challenges of higher education, how we can really build the workforce that is really needed for our region, for our state. Well, basically, this slide kind of gives you the, the set of challenge that we have. And it's, if you look at the continuum of, of education in California, from uh, all of the uh, ninth graders, you know, that, uh, uh, that in uh, the ninth grade of, in high school, we see of only 71% of them actually finish high school. And by the time they, and they get to a, a California State University and our University of California system, you can see that we only get to about 10% of that one. And of those ones, actually less than 4% actually get a degree in uh, STEM-related field. And there lies, I think, uh, the whole problem that we really have. And uh, what we really see for higher education as a whole, we see a major uh, loss of funding. Uh, there is a report that was uh, published uh, uh, about a year ago, by, uh, it's called The Race to Zero, and which shows that for the last uh, uh, 23 years or so, the uh, funding for higher education across the country has been dropping on a unilateral you know, uh, um, steady way. And if you extend those, uh, those curves, between two, uh, 2025 to 2050, the funding for of the states to for higher education is get to uh, will be getting to zero. So as part of that one, uh, what universities have been doing is seeing how we, we have been just uh, increasing the uh, the fees to at least uh, cover some of that, which has given us uh, student debt of over over a trillion dollars, far more than uh, uh, what our uh, our credit card um, costs are, or a debt that we have is. The other major factor is how uh, family income has become a predictor of, uh, uh, of achievement of higher education. Just to give you an example, about uh, of all of the uh, you know 25 year olds, if you if uh, they are in the to uh, top econ uh, economic quartile, they'll have an 80 percent chance of uh, having a four year college degree, and if they are from the bottom economic quartile, they have an 8 percent chance of having a uh, a, a four-year college degree. So it really means that the mobility has really kind of dropped off. And I think the other part is that we see as a nation, you know, after, after the, after the uh, uh, Cold War, the arms race really was converted to a brains race. And unfortunately, the way that as a nation we have been investing in higher education, you feel that we have taken a unilateral uh, disarmament. And, uh, and I think that really is part of the issue. I think universities have not really done their share to really come up and uh, try to look at more innovative ways either. And part of the university uh, issue is that we are very, you know, uh, very stereotypical uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of our uh, conservative nature. And uh, we want to make sure that we do that, uh, the tried and true approach. And that's, uh, I think, the whole concept of anticipatory retardation or the penguin effect. As all of you know, when penguins stand around the, an ice hole, they're all hungry. But they're waiting for which first penguin to go down because they're afraid there might be a shark down there. So even when you ask all of the, university, you know, the universities and you come up with the latest, uh, greatest idea, the first comment will be is yes, but what other universities have really used it? So there lies the, you know, every one of us want to be innovative, but at the same time, we want to see who has done it before. And uh, so we get ourselves to this kind of uh, aspect. And then although we have been using technology, technology has actually been used in areas of the business, uh, business factors in engineering and, uh, and ERPs and uh, other aspects, but not transforming the delivery of uh, education. And that's basically where the whole issue is. Another aspect that we have to remember with the millennials and the, uh, how um, uh, millennials learn and what kind of an attention span they have. You know, on the average, as all of us know, uh, millennials uh, uh, do somewhere between 3,000 uh, 3, to 4,000 uh, text messages uh, a month. And if you take about three to four minutes per text message, that's uh, over, you know, that's eight hours a day, which is more like a uh, full-time job for them. And if they have that kind of uh, other, uh, other aspects that uh, uh, consumes their attention, how can we really expect them to sit in a classroom and listen to a boring uh, 
professor like me for 50 minutes long. I mean, that's, that's not going to happen. And especially even when they are sitting in the class, yeah, they might be physically there while they could go and, you know, they could be in Facebook and, other, and all others. So what we have to do is to see how we can really, you know, we need to find ways that universities and higher education sector as a whole look at small changes as well as ma major changes and how we can really look at this in continuous changes as well as continuous changes. So that ambidexterity has to really become part of our DNA and really move higher education in a very significant way and uh, become far more uh, uh, risk takers. Part of the framework that we have looked at at uh, San Jose State is how we can really make the educational system a, very, a much more open system rather than a closed system that we are used to. And I'll, I'll give you one example of uh, uh, the uh, tele uh, television industry. If you go back to the 1950s and early 60s, practically every one of the small local TV stations were creating their own programs or a good part of their programs and then they were broadcasting it. Nowadays, at most, a local TV station might be doing their uh, the traffic and uh, uh, weather, maybe, or even that, they uh, get a download. But if you look at all of the universities and colleges, every faculty member at every semester develops their own STAT 101 course, History 101 course, on and so on and so forth. And look at the amount of energy that it's wasted while that energy could be used far better in the learning process uh, as a whole. So our whole view was, and then the other part is that if you look at educational system, we have the different sectors from the pre-K, the K through 12, community colleges, four-year universities, uh, research area, and industry. And each one of them, they are not really part of a working system together. So in every one of those uh, uh, changes and uh, transitions, that, tra that handoff or that transition is not as, uh, as uh, easy uh, as, as it needs to be. So our whole view is how we can really create an, an, an open, integrated uh, system where we can look at some of these basic courses or basic elements to be on the, uh, on the cloud. Uh, because if you look at a basic two-year college education, you can bring it down to about 25 courses. And there are uh, many studies that have shown that you can do that one. And if we have those courses available as the basic fundamental elements of what's there, and every, uh, first of all, many high school students could draw from it so they can get a lot of that competency before they actually get to the university. Uh, community colleges could use it. Uh, Four-year institutions could use it, and every institution can have their own element, but we will be making the whole cost of delivery of education so much simpler, and the faculty member can spend more of their time in interacting with students and helping in the learning process rather than what we're doing before, more. But also look at what's happening as far as the adult education, and then also when they become part of the industry. So the need of the industry, the competencies that industry are looking for has to be part of that loop, which sometimes we miss. I don't think industry, all of your uh, experience, the industries can really put the kind of resources they did before where they got their four year college uh, graduates and then train them for the next six months so they can be, uh, become useful for their own, uh, for their own uh, specific organization. Because right now, if you look, uh, there are many statistics that show by the time the current uh, four-year college students graduate, by the time they are 41 years old, they would have gone through about 10 job changes. So unless we really find that learn, uh, the continual learning process to be part of their, part of their uh, uh, you know, the routine, uh, we cannot really keep our workforce uh, uh, relevant uh, in universities, our view is in the commencement, we tell all of our graduates, good luck and goodbye. When you say goodbye, we really mean it. We only come back to them after 30 years when they become fam rich and famous. But we don't, I don't think any of you have gotten a letter from your uh, university saying there, so and so, what we taught you in the 1980s is uh, out of date, please come back and get retrained. Uh, so, uh, so how we, you know, so what we need to do is to really make that education as a continual part of uh, what we, and that basically is what we are hoping to do that in a, co in a concept. And then the other part would be is the, our link to the, to the in industry. You see, what are the kind of competencies that industry is really looking for? And uh, on a continual basis, how we can really update that so we can really uh, meet the kind of needs that the industry have. So as part of this, at San Jose State, when I, uh, when I uh, started there about um, uh, one and a half years ago, we had this, uh, 
uh, strategic framework which I came up with these five elements as uh, uh, the elements that you wanted to concentrate on in these one were Spartan prides, creating an unbounded learning environment, helping and caring, agility to technology, and creating the 21st century learning spaces. And we tried to put that one as some of our key areas of uh, key uh, projects that we were concentrating on. And these are animation systems, as well as of, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, cybersecurity, big data, and analytics, and globalizations. These are the, some key areas that we have been concentrating on. And we basically put that one very much as, as part of an uh, Baldrige-like model, so we can look at it from, the, from, the, uh, from our vision to the strategy, to operational measures, to targets and results. So what I'll do is talk a little bit about how the kind of framework that we have developed. And the framework is how can we really put a number of our, the 25 cores to, uh, or 40 cores that we can talk about, where students from anywhere could have access to it. And how we can, first of all, if we can eliminate the, uh, the remedial courses. Just to give you a sense, students who come to uh, California State System as a whole, uh, more than about 60% of them, 58% of them need some form of remediation in math or in English or both. Just in math, if I give you the statistics for 2010, nationally we admitted 3.1 million students. 55% of them required math remediation. That's 1.7 million people, students. 1.7 million students equivalent to the population of the city of San Jose in San Francisco. That's because we don't do a good a job in high school. Now, the model that we're talking about, if we have all of these courses available, students could do that on, while they are in high, still in high school. Not only that, the last year of high school is almost waste for most students. How can they really take some of their college courses while they're still in high school? And then community, and community colleges could use some of this, and for some students may only need a couple of weeks to be able to get finish that course. So that's how I think we can reduce the time for getting a two year, the first two year, and also reduce the cost in a, tre a tremendous way. But when we get to the upper division, that's where modules and course and material that the industry have, what we develop on campus, what we can use with other, from other universities, national labs, and other entities, we can combine all of those ones rather than creating all of ourselves. And I think that's how we can really build that kind of workforce that will, uh, uh, that will continuously, this will be part of their uh, lifelong learning process. Uh, briefly, I'll touch upon some of the key initiatives that we're working on. The first was so I said about agility to technology. We have become an anchor partner with Cisco. We have updated all of our uh, IT infrastructure. Right now, every one of our classrooms have uh, WebEx uh, capability. And by the end of this year, we have 50, uh, uh, 52 rooms that will have uh, uh, high definition uh, telepresence capability so we can bring f faculty members and speakers uh, both ways and our students could be involved in discussions with anyone anywhere in the world. <coughs> we were the first university that partnered with MIT edX and uh, last uh, semester we used the first course that MIT had on their electric circuit course. Traditionally that uh, course has about a 40% failure rate by using MIT material where students had to see the class before, uh, before they get to the uh, class, what that helped them was uh, they were able to see the lecture and then the, uh, the classroom was basically application and working in teams. The classroom attendance became 100% virtually. The failure rate dropped from about 40%. 40% of the students normally would get a grade of C or below. Now only 9% got a grade of C or below. Uh, the program has been so successful that uh, we're gonna be expanding it to 10, 11 other C, uh, California state system would like to be part of that, that we're gonna be working with them in this fall. But also by the next uh, fall, we will be offering a number of courses at San Jose State from the, through edX. The courses, uh, I think there will be about a couple of courses from uh, Harvard and two other courses from uh, Berkeley and a uh, couple of uh, additional courses from MIT. So I think that would really enrich our, um, uh, our uh, the offerings to our students in a very, very significant way. Uh, another one was how we were the first university that started giving uh, college credit for MOOCs. We partnered with uh, Udacity, and right now we, uh, we made an announcement about three weeks ago. We have just offered three courses, uh, a remedial math course, uh, first uh, college algebra course, and a statistics course. Our hope is that we can add more to it. The key is that for these courses, unlike regular MOOCs, 
the, coin, uh, the term that has been coined is the MOOC 2.0, where students will have, the students who are part of it, will have 24-7 uh, support services. So students, when they have any questions or any or working or they have difficulties, they will have access to uh, to a, a mentor. Uh, the most important element is that we are dropping the cost of those courses to $150, with no state subsidy and with no federal, uh, federal subsidy. I think that to us is the most important element because many students who otherwise will be totally shut out of the system, they'll be able to participate in it. We also have uh, started another uh, partnership with Stanford University for training faculty, so many of our, uh, their PhD uh, candidates who want to become faculty member, uh, San Jose State uh, is providing that, uh, that training, and I think that's, that will really help us in providing the far better faculty, not for only for us, as well as the rest of the, the, rest of the region. And two other initiatives, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, in the process of creating a center uh, for, uh, of excellence for cybersecurity. Uh, we're gonna be partnering with uh, Lawrence Livermore in Sandia, as well as uh, Homeland Security. Last uh, summer, we ran the first uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, summer camp. We had, uh, for West, basically, west of the Mississippi, we had uh, students here. This year, we're planning to do a number of uh, one day, uh, day, day, day camps for the local students, and then those who are successful will be able to uh, take this, uh, uh, this pr uh, the program for the full week. Uh, this is a uh, curriculum that's developed by NICE and uh, Homeland Security. And then the big data analytics, that's an area that we have just begun. We are, uh, will be very much interested in uh, if any of your uh, companies would like to work with us because we are you know, just in the process of putting uh, uh, a group together to, to be able to build uh, more concentrations in degree programs and certificates in this area. And finally, I think on one of the things that I'm hopeful on these three edX courses that we have, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, Udacity courses that we have developed as we pull more and more of the courses, not only we can offer them at $150, but ideally where students could start any time that they want to. Why do we have to wait? Why students have to wait till August just to start the course and they must finish a course by the uh, th uh, second week of December or start third week of January? I think students should start any time that they are and they should be able to take the exam whenever they want to because there are some courses I think students can finish based on their competence in two weeks and some other students may not even be ready in 16. So how can we really basically transform how the, the whole delivery of education is and how we can really build the workforce that we need, especially in the, the STEM competency in all of the different areas. So I think these are some of the key initiatives that we have really started. Basically, I think you know, we feel that, although it might be one university, one center, but I think San Jose State has always been powering the Silicon Valley. And collectively, I think with your assistance and what we can do, we'll, would like to see how we can really build that one in a, and make that much, much stronger. And the code that I really like, which I think should be uh, relevant for higher education, that we should be running more, far faster than what we are doing. And uh, you all as industry could really help us, push us as hard as you can, because there's a lot that needs to be done.